I hope you do. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jamia. That's good. I hope my voice is clear. So welcome back to a new lecture. Uh, actually, I hope that you have listened to the recorded lecture of yesterday um, concerning Shakespeare uh, course. And uh, I hope that you managed to um, listen to it carefully and that the the info was clear. Um, actually, I would like to have like almost 20 to 20 minutes to half an hour to discuss um, yesterday's uh, lecture. If you have any questions, and we'll talk about the exam, and then after Aisha, we'll start. We'll continue what we have already started. So, I will wait for your questions if you have any regarding not only yesterday's lecture, but even what we have discussed previously. Okay, I'll wait for your, you don't have questions. Okay, what about Tina? Okay, good. So let's then continue. Okay, what's your question about the exam, Afnan? Yes. Yes, there might be a quotation, and you tell me who is the speaker and to whom it was said, the context and the possible theme. Yes. Especially the soliloquies of Hamlet and the quotes of Lady Macbeth. But it can be there can be other uh, 
quotes, but mainly like quotes of the central character and central quotations to the theme, symbol, plot, etc. Yes, ladies, more questions about the exam? Okay, so I was waiting for your questions. Uh, now, about the topics. Well, I can't per se or specifically answer this question. Uh, you should focus on everything we have covered. You can notice uh, from the lectures and um, uh, the material we have uh, covered that uh, there are important spots um, we have talked about um, uh, short, certain aspects of Shakespearean tragedy, about tragedy, a comparison between Aristotle's definition of tragedy and Shakespearean tragedy. We are trying to apply the Shakespearean tragedy characteristics on uh, Macbeth. We are trying to uh, locate um, certain aspects of uh, uh, the uh, tragic elements uh, on on the play, etc. So uh, you have to... No, this is very simplistic. You cannot have only on characters. Character and another element, always a combination. It can be a quote on which you reflect and you link it to a theme. Uh, it can be a character symbol. It can be a character theme. There is no such one-dimensional topic. It's very simplistic. There is also um, the possibility of choice. I give you more than one topic and you choose one. And you write on what you are comfortable in the most.
Yes. Any more questions? Yes, it's a complete essay. Uh, introduction, uh, body paragraphs, and conclusion. You have to, uh, usually, uh, you can have like an essay made of uh, a number of questions which you need to answer in the given order so that you have an outline ready for you and you develop the question answers based on what you are asked. You add the, the conclusion and of course the what we call the introduction. This is also one possibility. So keep in mind that you have different possibilities. So we'll, we'll start in a few seconds. I don't know why the attendance is so poor today. I have only three students, but uh, they can always go back and listen to the lecture as recorded. So I'll just be right back in a few seconds because I need to access my material. Thank you. Okay, so the last point I talked about last time was the aspect of duality, the double aspect in the play, uh, whether in the character of uh, Macbeth, the character, the character, sorry, of Lady Macbeth, and the theme of illusion versus reality. So now I'm going to talk about actually an important um, aspect which is the given order in Macbeth. So um, the, the given order uh, leads us to um, certain themes which are favorite themes for Shakespeare in his tragedies. And the main theme of this play is that the absence of order in the world, uh, how uh, it is disturbed uh, by evil and how uh, the good side sometimes vanishes, but again, it goes back to its final um, um, actually uh, stage later on. Now, uh, you have to understand also that this theme is related to the the era in which the play was um, sort of uh, written. So we are talking about the Renaissance, and uh, the Renaissance conveys certain ideas about creation, uh, entitled the Great Chain of Being, and uh, this was actually uh, the concept. Um, in which they believed that this chain holds the world together. And the central concept or idea of the chain of being is that everything imaginable fits into it somewhere. So everything you imagine according to this great chain of being uh, can, be, can have uh, its own place um, in this chain. Uh, so, namely, uh, uh, a given order or meaning out to the universe. And uh, part of this belief also 
um, hides a belief in the divine right of the king. The king is uh, what what is the representation of uh, a godly presence through the king, which says that uh, the king has no equal uh, within the society, uh, and nobody else from the commoner, from the common people, uh, can replace the king. So he is actually in service of God's words uh, on earth, and no one can presume to his questions, acts, or uh, uh, contravene them. It means comes into contradiction with what the king says. Is that clear? Okay, um, let me stop a couple of seconds because of uh, uh, prayers, Ashan al Adan bus, and then I will resume. So let's continue, please. I was talking about the chain of being, the great chain of being, and um, we will try to see how this is applicable as a theme on uh, the play. So um, actually, um, what uh, Macbeth tried to do is to um, break through this order because his ambition uh, made him imagine that he can destroy a king and to step out of his order. And, of course, the array of consequences um, and the results will be uh, vast. Um, and, of course, the whole order of nature will, uh, will be in this order. And this is what we... Uh, see, and this is what happens in Macbeth. Macbeth's ambition leads to the overthrow of order in Scotland. And if you follow the events, the plot of the play chronologically, you are going to see that one man's flow, uh, his ambition, can turn a whole country into chaos. Is this idea clear? This is very important. Okay, so in Act 1, for example, you have Macbeth's ambition established. And it was uh, as early as um, actually the play opens. And uh, in his asides, uh, uh, he expresses a sense of guilt uh, to the reaction uh, of the witch's greetings. Stars hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. So uh, he's also upset um, at Malcolm's being named higher to the throne. He was jealous. That is a step on which I must overleap or else fall down. For in my way it lies. And admits I have no super to prick the side of my intent, but only vaulting ambition. So here, this order, his, his ambition already hides uh, an intention to create this order. And the disorder was associated with the appearance and the dialogue with the witches, the thunder lighting their appearance, their disappearance. Um, so later, uh, the disorder is evidenced in darkness, in character disorder, disorder of nature. Uh, notice the uh, sleep. Uh, uh, they sleep at, uh, 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 in the morning and they uh, wake up in the, uh, I mean, late at night. Uh, uh, walking sleep for Lady Macbeth, uh, nightmares, seeing ghosts, and also political uh, chaos. There is uh, uh, 
decide which is the most um, uh, actually um, bad act for, against the divine order. And Macbeth, of course, will suffer because he dared to uh, 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 overleap this order. Uh, in Act 2, for example, when Macbeth imagines a dagger pointing to Duncan's room, we see that his senses are affected by the very thought of murder. He says that nature, the whole nature, seems dead and that the witchcraft is abroad in the night as murder is moving towards his target. Uh, and after the murder, Macbeth is in turmoil. His, uh, his body is revolting against his own actions. Uh, he hears voices, imagines um, um, ghosts. He hears a voice saying, sleep no more. Uh, he's unable to say amen, to get close to God. So as if he were cursed. And from act uh, uh, two until the end, we see disorder throughout Scotland. Um, the discovery of the of the murder, all the chaos it creates, um, nature disorder, uh, uh, the night is unruly with chimneys blown down and screams of death and lamenting heard in the air. Uh, it's dark all day, horses eat each other, the country is questioning Donald Bain and Malcolm Flee. Uh, so there is a complete chaos. It's a bloody chaos. Uh, in act number three, also, uh, Macbeth's murder of his friend Banco is the most unnatural act because we expect Banco and uh, Macbeth to be very close friends. And in this case, his motivation uh, is actually the fear that he loses the crown to Banco. He was scared that Banco might be selected for the crown instead of him. And out of uh, jealousy and for the sake of his ambition, he uh, actually resulted in uh, murdering Banco and creating the most unnatural act, uh, not only to Banco, but to Banco's family. And the result is that his friend's uh, ghost, Banco, uh, was all the way um, uh, through in the place. So that was very unnatural. And Macbeth, after this murder, Macbeth speeds to his downfall. He's unable to sleep. He's afflicted by uh, terrible dreams. Uh, he shakes all night. Uh, uh, he's in a tortured state of mind, unable to sleep or eat. He can't uh, 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 actually think. And his mind was full of scorpions, as mentioned in the play. Uh, he resolves to seek out also the powers of darkness, the, the witches, uh, who as they come to him, uh, they, they, they actually um, go back to him and check what he did. They keep appearing and disappearing. Even the appearance of the witches uh, was actually um, um, sort of a pre-step for the disorder. And in act number four, after Hecate and the witches, they conspire and they show Macbeth the kings to come, he becomes a tyrant. He's no longer uh, uh, an aggressive person and he's no longer brave because he's losing more and more his positive characteristics. Now he becomes a whole tyrant and uh, uh, he decides irrationally to murder all of Macbeth's family. We see how the forces of order begin to gather to help him and the country now under, you know, a hand of a tyrant. Uh, and the setting also changes from Scotland to England. We hear that in Scotland, quote, each new morn, new windows hold, our country weeps, bleeds under devilish Macbeth. So Macbeth is no longer a tyrant and no longer aggressive. He's even devilish. Uh, uh, England, in contrast to Scotland, is uh, under a beloved king, Edward, 
and his blessings surrounds the throne and the forces of order both Malcolm and Macbeth they unite and with the help from the English they prepare to defeat Macbeth so this is at the beginning of the end as they say and the news also of uh, uh, the, the murder of Macduff are actually gathering. Uh, when we return to Scotland back in the last uh, act in Act 5, it is uh, uh, the sight of Lady Macbeth sleepwalking that we realize that uh, this order is in its complete shape. Now uh, uh, she, she talks uh, for darkness, uh, she needs no light, uh, she's constantly and ceaselessly attempts to wash the blood from her guilt, she sees uh, imaginary uh, spots on her hands and she screams out, uh, and she screams uh, out, out, damn spot and her senses are now all afflicted, uh, the smell also of the blood uh, is uh, is still for her. Uh, even the doctor uh, cannot get back her to her natural order, uh, and unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. This is what the doctor says. Uh, Macbeth also cannot uh, uh, own his own senses to mourn his wife, um, and uh, nothing can cure him uh, or the country. So the very also. Um, uh, suicide of uh, act of suicide, Lady Macbeth's suicide is a very unnatural uh, act and it's a result of the uh, disorder created right from the beginning. So this is a cause-effect relationship of the first step he took towards the um, a, like overlap of the order. And it seems that uh, Macbeth says she should have died hereafter. He can't even mourn her. Uh, there was also more time to grieve for her, but he cannot concentrate for that. And, and um, his irrationality, irrationality is also uh, uh, is also uh, uh, clear. So uh, uh, when uh, when Macduff provokes Macbeth into the final fight, this is when the order is restored when Macbeth uh, is killed and uh, also um, uh, we have uh, Malcolm the rightful heir takes the throne um, and um, uh, there is actually a new phase of order. Uh, we are left also with some unease in, the, in, in, in imagining Malcolm who is uh, waving um, uh, Macbeth's bloody head and proclaiming uh, Macbeth a bachelor uh, and his lady a saint. So we have seen both how Macbeth and Lady Macbeth suffer until the very end. Um, and um, uh, they were simply people who had ambition, but their ambition was running very wild. And for that ambition on the entire country, there was a chaos. And uh, with with uh, with Malcolm being the right heir to the throne, we have order achieved. So order always returns in one way or another. Is that clear? They incite the evil. They come to uh, people who have a hidden side of evil. They represent the supernatural.
Yes, Afnan, I'm not talking. I'm just thinking about the next point. And you can think about what we have just discussed in case you have uh, a question with Salwa and Lina. Okay, let's now talk about the themes. Let's comment the themes. So for the themes, the first, I want you to make the difference between theme and also uh, motive. I'll explain in uh, a minute. So uh, for the themes, you have ambition, fate and free will, appearance and reality, as well as kingship. For the motive, the motive is actually a recurrent element. It's an element that is repeated, uh, uh, and it's a repeated pattern, like, for example, images, symbols. There is a number of images and symbols in Macbeth which create the motives of the play. Uh, and also they support the themes. They go hand in hand with themes. Na uh, so the motives, you have nature, the natural world, uh, light and darkness, sleep and vision, as well as blood. So for the themes, we have the first theme, ambition. Ambition, as you can see, is a devastating, um, actually, idea. And it's a devastating uh, uh, feeling. Uh, it, it follows that ambition oversteps any boundary, any moral boundary, any ethical boundary. And uh, the related scenes that emphasize uh, this uh, theme is actually Act 1, Scene 5. You have how Lady Macbeth receives Macbeth's letter, analyzes his character, and uh, pushes uh, uh, him to uh, collaborate with the evil inside him, the forces of evil. She embellishes the idea of um, uh, ambition and kingship. Uh, then, in Act 1, Scene 7, you have Macbeth reflecting on what is needed to achieve his ambition, uh, and Lady, Lady Macbeth actually uh, is uh, pushing him to uh, shake his courage uh, uh, and um, uh, transgresses um, his uh, weakness. In Act 3, uh, Scene 1, Macbeth determines to kill Banco in order to prevent his children uh, to succeed to Scotland's uh, throne. For the kingship, uh, of course, uh, uh, there is here uh, a reference to the binary opposition, the contrast between appropriate use of power uh, uh, needed to ensure uh, order and tyranny. And we have related scenes to that. Act 1, Scene 7, we have uh, Macbeth studying, reflecting uh, Duncan's qualities as king. In Act 3, Scene 6, we have 
uh, Lennox and another helper discussing life under Macbeth's rules. And we have in Act 4, Scene 3, Malcolm and Macduff comparing tyranny to honorable kingship. For uh, fate and free will, uh, we have uh, the extent to which we control our destiny. So we have a margin uh, in which we, uh, um, we decide whether what we are going to do is under our control or not. So we do what we can and we leave um, the, the other coming naturally. The thing is that um, Macbeth wanted to um, um, sort of transgress to defy the fate. So in Act 1, Scene 3, Macbeth and Banco encounter the witches by chance. Uh, and uh, Macbeth questions and tries to reflect their prophecy. And Act 2, Scene 1, Macbeth still insists on talking with Banco about their encounter with the witches. He sees a visionary dagger, makes his decision to kill Duncan. So this has nothing to do with the witches. The witches did not influence him. He has this uh, extra ambition to uh, uh, think about the witches. Uh, the, the, actually, uh, the idea stayed ruminating in his mind. In Act 6, Scene 1, Enter Fate and, will, uh, and Free Will as a theme, Macbeth, Macbeth sorry, visits the witches again, and uh, they offer him further prophecy. For appearance and reality, we have already talked about that, but what you should keep in mind is that how uh, people and events are often not as they seem to, uh, uh, to be. In Act 1, Scene 1 and 2, the witches invoke conf confusion. Uh, they talk in uh, contrast, in, um, um, in illusion. They are palasim. They say, fair is fool, fool is fair. In Act 1, Scene 4 also, Duncan reflects on uh, the theme of Cowder, and he rewards Macbeth with this title. I have begun to plant tea and will labor to make tea full of growing. So this is also a very confusing um, statement about Macbeth when we were waiting for Thane of Cowder to be entitled. Um, uh, 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 actually, uh, Duncan chose Macbeth. In Act 1, Scene 6, we have Duncan remarking on uh, Macbeth's castle having a pleasant seat and Macbeth plots his own murder. So he was plotting against Duncan, although Duncan was praising and interested in Macbeth. Is that clear, ladies? Yes, violence is more than a theme. It's a theme and a motive at the same time. It's, uh, it's enveloping the whole play. Also among the themes, we have the fall of men, and we have also uh, gender roles. We have reason versus passion. We have violence.
So for the motive, we have nature, the natural world, and how it is disordered, disrupted, when of course uh, uh, the, the limits of morality and ethics are broken. So um, in Act 1, Scene 3, we have a quote saying against the use of nature. It's unnatural, even like the deed that's done. And his gushed stabs looked like a breach in nature. Boundless intemperance in nature is a tyranny. Uh, we have also light and darkness. They represent innocence and evil, good and evil. Stars hid your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. That darkness does the face of earth in Tom when living light should kiss it. Come seething night, scar up the tender eye of pitiful day. We have also blood. We have, uh, it represents evil plans and it represents revenge. It represents violence. And of course, it's a, a direct consequence of over aching ambition of uh, transplant, sorry, transgressing uh, uh, the, the, the theme of or the step of um, ambition. So uh, for, for sleep also, it's a natural process and it was disrupted and caused by the fracture of the natural order and the moral order. Uh, so we have also vision. They represent the extension of guilty conscious. Is that clear? Okay, very good. So I'm going to stop here for today and I'm going to, uh, we are done uh, with uh, Macbeth and what I'm going to do is that uh, I'm going to move inshallah on Tuesday to comedy, uh, uh, 12th night and we are going to study the background first and then study and comment on the play. Is that clear? Do you have any questions so far? Okay, that's good. So, see you inshallah on Tuesday. Till then, good luck with your lectures and all the best. Have a good evening. Fi amanillah. Bye.